You said before that people don't talk about money. And the truth is that people don't even talk to themselves about money. So what we do is we create that environment where people can actually go internal because a lot of this is subconscious. And that's what people need to say, tell their story there and then see the patterns and go, they're my behaviours, they're my beliefs, they're my behaviours, I want life to change. You're listening to Elevate, the official podcast of Elite Agent for real estate industry sales professionals, property managers and leaders. With thanks to our partner Connect Now, Elevate brings you the best tools, thinking and strategies to elevate your results. To get access to all of Elite Agent's premium resources, including a detailed episode guide for this podcast, visit joineliteagent.com. And for more information about how Connect Now can make moving easier on your clients, visit connectnow.com.au. Here is your host, Samantha McLean. Welcome to another episode of the Elevate podcast where we delve into some of the most interesting minds in business and in real estate for the very best tips and strategies for you to implement to elevate your business. I'm Samantha McLean, editor of Elite Agent and host of today's show. My guest today is certified financial planner and Quantum Leap Global co-founder Michael DeHaan. As a financial wellness leader, Michael helps business owners and individuals address limiting beliefs and behaviours around money. So Michael, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, it's cool. Well, money's money's such an awkward topic, isn't it? Like, why is money such an awkward um, awkward topic for people to talk about? That's a really, really good question. And it, it's similar to mental health. So it's very much a taboo subject. And, and there's a lot of emotion around it. Yeah, there's a lot of people that are saying, I should be this in life. Or I, sh- I should be in that. I should have a house. I should have this. I should have that. And there's a lot of embarrassment. So people really tend to hide their feelings around money, even in relationships, to be honest. So coming into a loving relationship, I'm still not going to talk about money. Um, I'm still going to, not going to talk about my sort of values or how I was brought up around money because I don't feel safe. And this is a dialogue that we need to have is to really open up the discussions around money, open up the discussions around mental health because in actual fact, money, financial stress in particular, is the leading cause of anxiety, depression, And it's one of the leading causes of relationship breakdown. So we've got the evidence. We just need to actually have the conversations. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think um, it'd be great if we can get into some money management strategies today because, I mean, it's hard in real estate, um, I think, because, you know, very much commissions can be tied to what the market's doing. I mean, we've just gone through a a, a bit of a boom period, but, you know, we know in real estate that, you know, there are cycles, some are good and some are not so good. Um, and, you know, it, it is quite interesting. So I'd like to go in for a deep dive on the, on the money side of things for the individual agent, but look at the cash flow of businesses as well. So let's start talking about financial mindset because you've mentioned financial well-being isn't about how you spend your money, but the way you think about it. So tell me, um, you know, what is a healthy way to think about money versus an unhealthy way to think about money? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll just go back a step if I can, because I was talking to a business coach colleague of mine who coaches real estate businesses. And she was at a recent conference and I can't confirm the stats but she was stunned by two points that came up, which is only 20% of real estate agents will ever earn more than a million dollars in gross commission. And where agents are in year five in their career is generally where they will stagnate in regard to earning money. So what that says to me is that that's that glass ceiling. Yeah. And the glass ceiling is around your mindset, around money, your, your worthiness and an abundant mindset. So, I just found that a really interesting stat to sort of set a context around talking about mindset because I think it's like in particular to the real estate um, industry. So so I'll talk about what an unhealthy relationship with money is. Um, And it's really, if you you look at where it stems from, so you're looking at how you're brought up around money. So this is sort of the programming. It's the, uh, from generally from naught to seven. So you're being guided by your mum and dad as an example, or, or can be family members um, in regard to their relationship with money. And what you find a lot is a, a scarcity around money, yeah, not enough. And um, it's a way of looking at, you know, rich people, they, they just, you know, they're unethical or people that earn money are bad. Um, rich people sort of, you know, do their own thing. They don't really, um, they're dishonest as an example. And these are the sort of things that we, 
program say from 0 to 7 you don't have a conscious mind so that becomes your program without you even questioning it because you can't so then you actually start filtering that and that sort of shows up in your in your life so it sort of creates your thoughts around money your beliefs around money and then that creates the behaviors around money so that's really interesting because I can remember sometime in the period not to seven having a 50 cent coin in my mouth and my grandmother was saying to me, get that money out of your mouth, it's dirty. <laughs> like, <laughs> is, this, is this what we're talking about? It certainly is. And um, I'm, I'm working with a client at the moment, just to give you an example of that. So sort of brought up in the Housing Commission, you know, very poor, um, sort of had self-worth issues, but that he's always said money is bad, money is evil, you know, don't trust anyone with money. And he's starting his own business but he gets really nervous and doesn't want to confront anyone with money. So this is a this is a man that's got a lot of beliefs, a lot of passions about what he what he wants to do in life. But the mindset around you know how do I deal with people with money? Um, because that's a part of business, yeah. Yeah. So I was just saying that that's the work we need to do with him to actually understand that story that was said when he was quite young, over and over, which became a belief which became a habit and then we actually need to change that into something that will serve him in regard to having a successful business. I'm thinking about different ways that this might manifest itself for us as grown-ups and the one that comes immediately to mind is not valuing ourselves enough that when someone says you know how about you give me a discount on on that fee or on your commission that people cave pretty quickly um is 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 that one of the ways that this plays out most certainly yeah it's it's a lot of people not having the confidence to charge what they're worth and, and really understanding that and it even plays out in business where you're not even following up all the prospects that are sort of coming into the business we even find in some businesses when they're sort of invoicing or having to collect money they feel guilty yeah so, and if they're not paid within a one you know within, within the terms of the contract they won't even follow up the client because again, that's that self-worth again, well, I put it out there, they're not paying, they mustn't, I mustn't be deserving of, of receiving. So in, in real estate, I mean, we, we've had a bit to do with real estate um, recently, probably over the last three months. And um, so we negotiate fairly hard on the, on the price, on the commission in a sense there, but, but in a fair sense, because we acknowledge there's got to be a win-win. But it gives you an insight into the person that's going to take your property and get the best price for you that you want to see them in action. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, um, you know, you, you want to see somebody and their ability to negotiate their own fee so that you know that they can negotiate your property when it comes time to sell. Exactly. And I respect someone that says, well, here's what you get. Here's the value you're getting me. This is what it looks like. This is what I can do. And the price is the price. Yeah. There's respect for that. So I want to dig into what those statistics that you just said in a second, um, because I, I do believe that 20% I, the first one um, doesn't shock me at all, which is 20% will 20% of agents will earn over a million dollars. The second one did kind of shock me a little bit that you know where you are at year five is is where you're going to be. Um, why do you think that is? I think they've hit their ceiling. So and I'll, when I reflected on that, and that was just two days ago that I met with her, and I just looked back at at my life, and I know I was earning, I was in corporate, I was in the banking um, management roles, I was earning good money and I actually said to my wife at the time that I don't need to earn any more money, any money that I receive now I'll give away. Yeah. So that that was my ceiling. Yep. And then that I never earned anymore. So that, that was my belief system, that was my deserving and if I look back and was able to change that belief to say that get rid of the home loans, build wealth, um, make the impact and the sustainability that I want to create in this world, I would have had a different view, but I was, I was making decisions based on sort of limiting beliefs and limiting programs that weren't serving me. So that, that was a, a classic example of that. You have defined some money types. So do you mind telling me what these money types are? Yeah, and it's, it's interesting that they're sort of eight money types and, and people can be active in, in a number of them, yep. And the, 
I think the value is, so I'll go through them. So there's, there's an innocent money type where, again, you, you won't look at the issue. You'll put your head in the sand and just hope it goes away, and it never does. <laughs> but that's not good for business. Um, you've got that victim money type where people have got a story, and, and, and generally it's a, it's a valid story. So they've been through something there, but they carry that story, and that becomes their identity. So even dealing with money. So, again, that's disempowering. Yep. We've got the martyr where they put everyone first and they put themselves last. Um, but at the same time, even with money, they actually still expect something. They just don't know how to ask for it. Yeah. Yeah. And then we've got the gambler. So they actually, money flows through to them. And I think this is relevant to financial planning industry where you can make a lot of money, um, real estate, and property development, which I know those industries fairly well. And money comes in, in potential bulk, yeah, good seasons, and uh, you earn a lot of money, and then money flows out as quick as it flows in. So that can create that financial stress as well, because in a sense, you're not honouring money, and it's saying that I want to build a life of financial freedom. Yeah. And, and that's not looking at the long term. Um, a tyrant where you use that money as control, that's really unhealthy. They control people's lives. <laughs> and then you're looking at the positive, so the warrior, which is uh, taking accountability, setting themselves up for what their future looks like, being intentional around what money needs to do for them. And then the magician that sort of has that belief that they're deserving, that whatever they put out to the universe, they can create. And that's that, that abundant mindset. So there's, there's two that are really empowering and there's a number that are just empowering, which... Um, a lot of us have a number of those different money types. Yeah, I've, I feel like I've just categorised myself in a few of them, like you mentioned I would, but you still haven't mentioned the one where I hide my um, online purchases from my husband. <laughs> <laughs> what one does that fall into? I, I got a feeling that's that innocent. So you're actually acting out something there, but you're just hoping you don't get caught. Yeah, this old thing. I've had it for, <laughs> <laughs> I've had it for ages. Um literally I was just thinking through as as you were saying some of those different types and and definitely putting myself into some of those those buckets you know and I like that there are some that are positive as well as negative yeah. and I also like that you know like just in you know when we talk about wellness in general um, you know the message is to put your own oxygen mask on first and I think that was the message that you were actually giving giving me then as well very strong message Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's when, if, if we look at, and again, we, we look at that societal norms where, generally speaking, women are brought up to be the carer and the male is the provider. And then when, if you're either having children or you, the way you're showing up in regard to, yes, you can care for people, but you put yourself first and you're sort of designing your life around joy and abundance, then your children are learning from you. So you're creating a whole different mindset around what societal norms and conditioning actually is, but really in a sense it's people having compassion for self and living their best life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's actually, that's a very, it's um, reframing, you know, the earlier situation that we kicked off with like completely, isn't it? Exactly right. So is that how you work with people to kind of reframe their beliefs about money? Like, like, you know, I've sort of been thinking that 50 cent coins are dirty ever since I was about five, which we've just talked about. <laughs> um, how do you go, and, and you know, I'm not a spring chicken anymore, if, in case you hadn't noticed, but um, <laughs> how, do you, um, how do you go about reframing people's views around money? And it's, it's interesting, you said before that people don't talk about money. Yeah. And the truth is that people don't even talk to themselves about money. Yeah. So what we do is we create that environment where people can actually go internal because a lot of this is subconscious. And that's what people need to say, tell their story there and then see the patterns and go, they're my behaviours, they're my beliefs, they're my behaviours, I want life to change. So then we look at the money types and then how that influences their decisions around money. And an example of that is that, that sort of victim money type where we share stories about what, what that's created and then we'll look at the truths around that in regard to now and really what they want to create and we, we we in a sense sort of lose that money type or weaken it and start building strong money types there that, that's built around confidence it's built around clarity and it's built around that i i can i've got the ability 
to set up the life that I want. I was just on autopilot. I just needed that awareness and I, I needed the tools to guide me on that pathway that I, I'm choosing to live my life. Yeah, interesting. So we don't want to be giving anyone financial advice on this show because, um, well, I'm certainly not a qualified financial advisor. But if you were, you know, knowing knowing what you know about the real estate industry, because I know you're quite close to, um, you know, to the industry as a whole, and I was a young agent sitting in front of you saying, you know, how do I how do I set myself up for the future? What sort of um, things would you be saying? That's a really interesting question. So. And what I'll be saying, and, and it might make sense to them initially, yep, is to do the internal work. And really that is aligning beliefs and behaviours to actually understand what they are before you really grow in that industry. And, and I'll tell you why that, I mean, as I said, with a lot of um, estate agents, planners, accountants, whatever, and we're talking about money, but I can get a sense whether they're aligned with their words and their body. Yep. And... I've got an awareness around that and, and that will make me go somewhere else potentially if I don't feel that alignment with, but there's a lot of people that won't even be able to answer that. They just go, there was a, there's a gut feeling. I just, I just sense something that I, and, and if I'm going to a, say a real estate agent, that's going to sell my property. We were, we sell our property now. And if I felt uncomfortable that they had central beliefs or something was going to hold them back from, you know, supporting me fully to get the best price, well, then I, I would potentially move somewhere else and, and go to the next one. And it's not, it's not around commission. It's around a, a, a sense of being a whole of self. So that would be the first one. And that, that would be something that I've probably never heard before, <laughs> do the internal work. But, but then it's really them creating that. When you create a vision about what your next five to 10 years looks like, so we're talking about someone young now, so you're not talking about retirement because we'll bore that crap out of them. But... So what do they want their life to look like? Really set some intentions around, you know, and, and really get that buzz around it. So what does that look like? What that, you know, the excitement piece around that? And then set up the structure around how the flow of money is going to serve them. So if you look at the barefoot investor, they look at different accounts there. So if it all goes into one pot, and we'll talk about that in business, but if it all goes into one pot, when you're just starting out there, it'll all be spent. Yeah. But if you're a young person and you're saying, I really want to get into the property market, I'm in the industry, I reckon, I, I can, you know, I'm learning all about it. So I'll actually go in there. I want to set myself up that in a year or two years' time that I've got the deposit funds that I need and I'm watching it grow every fortnight, month, whatever it is. That's when you actually got that control and that excitement and you're making that vision come to life. So it's interesting, This um, what you just said then makes you very different from sitting in front of an accountant or someone like that who's probably going to judge you on, you know, like how much tax you paid and what your group certificate looks like and, and all that sort of thing. Whereas what you're saying is it's more of a, like, let's look at the person and see what's going on for them. Look at them and don't put them in a sort of a, a basket or a box. Um, really understand, get rid of, as I said, that societal conditioning and norms. Really, what, what do they want out of life? And when you create that, when you're that whole person, whatever you're doing in work, um, that, that'll shine through and people will be attracted to you and you'll be successful in, in my view. Yeah. So let's go back to the agent who's been in the business for five years, who's just hit the ceiling. How do we work at getting them back on the path to growth again? If Assuming that's what they want. I mean, some people get to the five-year point and they're earning a nice living and, and you know, they don't have any ambition to be a million-dollar agent. But, you know, for some people that actually go, I think I'm stuck in a rut, what can I do? And it's understanding why they're stuck in that rut. It's going back and actually looking at why they feel stuck, whether they feel stuck, and, and some of the patterns and beliefs that have created that. But it's getting clarity around what they truly want in life. Again, we we'll go back to how powerful that vision is. So they're just saying, I've got another 10, 15 years in this industry. I'm stuck at the moment here. But we start working out to get that excitement back. We actually start working about what they really want out of life, where they want to live, you know, what's, what's the impact, what they love doing, what they want to be learning. We, we, we create that and then there's more, almost that uplift. They're going, well, I want that. I want that future self. I don't want to feel the way I'm feeling at the moment. So then we actually have to do the money task, whatever, which is just setting the foundation. But there's a, there's a different energy 
there's a different way that they go about the business. They talk differently. It's, that's the exciting bit, just to see the shift in their mindset because they got clarity. I actually, yeah. I, I'll sit down with clients to begin with and I'll say, I'll ask them what brings you joy in your life and most can't answer on the first um, session. But then when we actually dig a bit deeper and actually get them to express that and start building that future picture and then just start looking at how do you live intentionally, how do you show up every day to achieve that? And they're going, oh, I can do that. This is, I just, I was a little bit lost. Yep. I just need that, that, that pathway to have a bit more clarity. Yeah, clarity can be such a gift, can't it? And the fact is that people would like, and if you're looking at your life, 95% of that's run by your subconscious, which is your programming, which was, in a sense, given to you generally from your parents. So you're, in a, you're on autopilot and you're looking five or ten years time, you're going, well, what have I done? Yeah. Where you, you can, if you've got that awareness and, and curiosity about what's happening in your life and saying, Here's, I want to make some changes, reach out to the right people to get that support and, and sort of dig in deep enough and then change it, change your narrative, change your story, change your life. Yeah. So if if the people around you gave you some weird beliefs about money growing up, find a better board of directors that will give you some more positive beliefs and be able to help you get clarity on where you really want to be. And there might be a reason why their board of directors are saying that because that might be what you're showing. So it's always, it's when we look external, an external would be these board of directors as an example. So they're saying it from a place of that they've got a role to play and there's a concern there. So it'd be a matter of taking that on and going, well, what are they saying? What, what am I hearing? Uh, you know, and then looking internally and going, well, some of that's sort of legitimate and all, but a lot of times we actually look at that and push back going, well, you know, what, what do you guys know or whatever? We sort of push back without having an acceptance and then going, well, I'm going to go away and do some internal work around this because there's obviously I'm showing up in one form or another. Yeah, interesting. That's, that's, that's powerful. We could talk for hours about this personal <laughs> money stuff. <laughs> it's it's, like, it's, it's, I feel like I'm. I feel like I'm having a bit of therapy here too. <laughs> but um, how funny! Let's let's move on um, to like the business side of things because again, you know, for a lot of people listening, um, you know, a lot of them at any point in time are thinking about making the leap from being an agent working for someone to being. Um, you know, a business owner or working for themselves. And look, I, I actually sort of, I've heard someone say the term agentpreneur um, <laughs> recently because I actually think, you know, if, if you're in real estate, you're an entrepreneur anyway, like end of story. When do you know if you're ready to take on that extra responsibility of having your name on the door? And, and that's a really, really good question because the difference between an employee and running your own business is completely different. Because then you're managing teams, and this is where a lot of leaders. And I, you had an interview with Marianne; she would have talked about that true leadership, that the true qualities of a leader. But I think you really need to have a look at one: whether you're ready, do you have those sort of qualities? Can you run a team that, that's motivated? Because you could be a gun agent, earning great commission, and and just have the right structure within the business and earning great income, create wealth, and, and all that. But when you do it yourself, that's, that's the vulnerable side because you're going out there, everything's about you. You've got to take that um, team on the journey with you and you've you got to motivate them. You've, you've got to, they've got to feel like they belong. They've got to be included, inclusive, and you've got to have the qualities as a leader to be able to do that. But also then you've got the, um, the running of the business, and this is where you know, generally you you, you get paid your commission, they take splits, whatever, and then that's your money and that's easy. But when you're running your business, you've got to, as an entrepreneur, the key, in my view anyway, around money is to predict the future around your cash flow. And that's the success of an entrepreneur. So they can actually very closely predict how the money's going to flow over, or over sort of a three, six or even 12 month period in their business by doing some really good forecasting. And that's, that's valuable in regard, because that's a, a mindset, because you feel in control. And the other, 
and, and we've done that in our business and we need prompts because you, you do have to follow a system there, but it's, it's powerful to know that in eight weeks' time we're going to come up with an issue around paying the expenses as an example. So what do we do now? So we're not reactive. We're, we're proactive in regard because you're going to have costs like you're a business owner, so you're going to have to pay wages, you're going to have to pay rent, whatever, whatever the case may be. So having that sort of control around how the money flows. And the other one is that this profit first model, which we put in our business and it's, it's, all, it's all around mindset because generally speaking, the money flows in to an account and money flows out and you don't have a lot of control over that. But the profit first model says that you work out what profit the business should pay you for the risks that you take as a business owner, whether that's 15, 20, 25%, whatever. You pay yourself second. You, pay, you put money in a tax account third and then you pay out all the expenses fourth. And that's a shift in mindset that you actually can look at your business and go, well, if I can't pay what I should be in the profit, am I spending too much? Am I not charging the right commission? Am I paying too much for start? Like, but it, it creates questions. Yeah. Um, that's, is, is that, that Mike Michalowicz's book, Profit yes. First, that you're talking <laughs> yeah. about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. In, uh, like I was going to ask you about that actually, but um, but now that we've now that we've mentioned the topic, like a lot of business owners, and you know, and I think even we've been guilty of this at times, is you know you don't you don't take a wage, like you know, but that can be a bit of a trap to fall into, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the key that you pay yourself last, generally speaking, whatever's yeah. left in the bucket. But it, again, if you look at and they use the analogy of the toothpaste. In regard to expenses, um, I, don't, I don't know whether you've seen it present. So if you're looking at your business, money coming in, money coming out, and there could be money going out that you need to be smarter with in regard to what you're paying, whether it's marketing, whatever the case may be. And so if there's only a portion of the money going into this expense bucket, you're going to make it work. So the toothpaste analogy is, you know, when it's getting towards the end there, you're going to make it work. Yeah. For whatever reason, it's going to last another month. I don't know how we do it. And you get to the point when you've got both fingers on there and you're still trying to get it there and it, it actually pops up and then pops back down because you can't, you know, but you make it work. <laughs> and also you never can put toothpaste back in the tube, so you've got to be careful squeezing it out, right? <laughs> exactly right. But isn't that a great sort of mindset just to say, I'm running a business, I'm taking a risk, it's got to be profitable because that's sustainability. I've got to pay myself a fair wage. I've got tax liabilities. And then this bucket at the end, how do I make that work and be really efficient, processes, systems and all that to still run the business? Yeah, it's a great book. We'll leave some links as well as leaving links to your stuff, but we'll leave some, some links to Mike Michalowicz's Profit First because it's actually, it's a pretty good book. And uh, like I've seen some people just said that it's changed their lives completely. Yeah, and I interviewed the CEO of um, the that runs the Australian division and um, just amazing. It's, you know, they, there's accountants and bookkeepers actually bringing that model into their business to add value to business owners. I mean, that's what they should be doing. <laughs> but <that's, laughs> for that aside, it's really partnering now with these advisors that are starting to add a lot more value to your business. Yeah. So I want to ask you another question. I think this probably relates back to our earlier conversation on views about money. When I talk to agents... A lot of them will say to me, I'm so busy. <laughs> um, and the answer to being busy often is to put on an assistant, but everyone's reluctant to put on an assistant. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people are reluctant to put on a, an assistant because then obviously there are two mouths to feed in the business. Yeah. What sort of things would you, be, um, would you be saying to somebody in that position to get themselves ready to, you know, make life better? It all depends what, what they mean by I'm too busy. Because I say that when Mary Ann walks past, so I don't get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's relevant to um, what busy actually means. And is, is busy actually just being really focused on getting results, you know, really great campaigns, really strong marketing that's got a lot of leads flowing through, you know. So what does busy actually mean? That's That would be the first question. Because if you've got money coming through, that gives you the peace of mind there. I, I do need and I can afford this person because they're going to make my life easier. I know because I've got the mindset, I know what I'm doing is working, that with that I'll be able to go out and do more. 
so be, without sort of knowing that, just saying I'm busy, generally speaking, which I'm guilty of, saying, well, how do I know whether I can afford, you know, because I, it is, is me being busy bringing in the revenue that I need to have a sustainable business. Yeah, because scrolling Facebook doesn't count as busy, right? <laughs> I thought it did. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I hear no. But um, just a couple of last questions for you. Like I was reading on your website that financial stress can have a major impact on, on members of a high-performing team in terms of productivity. So is it true that 55% of employees – um, in some way are suffering from financial stress. And this is a bit of a passion of mine, so I'm glad you touched on that because this is the major issue in corporates, businesses that, are, that have employees because they, they can't bring their whole selves to work there because they're, they're financially stressed. So you're looking at the stats there that generally they take three to four extra six days a, a year, seven to ten hours they're, they're financially stressed and they're not focused on work each week but also you're looking at the mental health side so you're looking at some stats there by um, New South Wales Work Safety so the claims are increasing by 53% I'm not sure whether Marianne shared that with you but the time off work is 175 days on average for people that are going through this financial stress and, and leading to that sort of anxiety and, and potentially depression so employ, employers need they, there's wellness programs out there but there's not a real link between a wellness program which does touch on mental health and massages maybe and um, a few fruit. <laughs> Got to get into that bowl early and uh, the, the coffee pods, whatever. <laughs> but they, for the first time, there was research going actually to employees and saying, what stresses you out the most? And it's financial stress. And, and generally speaking, there's not a solution for employees and businesses to work together to create that space around true wellness in my view. And, and what that does create is that they feel valued, that, that they can work through the stresses, the behavioural side and, and come to work. And, and one, they're actually more aligned to the business. They feel valued and they're, they're working a lot harder, but they're, they're creative. They're not going through the stress that um, you're seeing. It's, 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 a, it's, a really, it's a major issue. Yeah. And obviously a strong passion of mine as you would. Yeah. No, it's um. Uh, look, I've 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 been there and done that, so I can actually wholeheartedly from the first person say you're right. You know, like when you are under financial stress, um, it is really hard to focus on work because you're constantly in a state of worry, and then, you know, worry is very unproductive, right? Exactly right. Exactly right. And we're working with businesses at the moment that really want to showcase themselves as true employers of choice, because the market's tight in regard to getting good people. So you really need to look, create that environment where they can feel like they belong, they can be heard, but it's also around the wellness side, but the true wellness, where they feel safe, they come into work there and they feel like they can grow in this business, be a better person and, and feel like, as I said, they're, they're really valued in the business. So it's a, it's a, it's a win-win. Yeah. So if you're a leader in a business at the moment and you, you're kind of worried about um, your employees and maybe the amount of financial stress that, that they may be under, what's a good way to open up a conversation about that? And that's a really good question. And, and what I would suggest to that is that you mightn't open up the conversation. And why I'm saying that is that if you actually bring in a, a holistic financial wellness program, to all employees, 55% of them will take them up. It's doing it in a safe way. So they've all got access to the modules around their behaviour, their money types, how that might be showing up in their life and education around investing and whatnot. So they they can get the confidence, they can actually understand who they are there and there's no judgment in regard to who they are. So, well, that's it because the last thing you want is your boss coming up to you and going, hey, do you need some help with money? <laughs> like, exactly. And, you know. and I mean, that would be great conversations, but I, I'm just saying that there's another way that you can do it organically where everyone feels safe and, and they can actually in their own time go through the program and, and even reach out if they want further advice to dig deeper. There's that opportunity for them. So that's, that's a sort of safer way. And we, we will have a look at set some KPIs around the health of the business financially and then overall at the end of the program because a business owner still wants to see 
their return on investment per se, and they want to see growth, they want to see employee engagement. So you, you can do all that, but it's, it's from a pool of the whole employees. It's not one person going, you know, I was financially stressed, didn't know what to say, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's, that's really good advice to sort of treat it as a holistic thing rather than as a, you know, a, a hey, you okay kind of thing. Yeah. So we've talked about Mike Michalowicz's Profit First. Are there any other favourite books on the topic that you'd love to recommend to our listeners? There, there's two, and I've got, I've got them here, but I, The Law of Attraction, um, I'm sort of big on there because that's manifesting what you want in life. I think that's sort of so important. Um, I'm not a massive book reader, so if I'm reading a book, it means that I'm really centred around it. <laughs> and the other one is uh, The Heart of Money, and it, it really is around a couple's guide to creating true financial intimacy because when couples don't talk about money and they come into that relationship and they've got different stories around money, they've got different beliefs and values, and without talking about it, if I, if I said to you, going back to your story around your, your spending, I, I, go, I, I would say, not tell you, but I'd go, all she does is just spend and, you know, that, that's not my money, so I want to say it. She's not respecting me, but you don't have the conversation potentially. So you start drifting away on that sort of money intimacy and it, it sort of starts that wedge in the relationship. So there's some great learnings in that book in regard to having a framework around those really open and honest conversations and that's, yeah, so two, two great books, yeah. So, Michael, I just want to thank you for um, for coming on the show and sharing some of your knowledge. It's been a really fascinating sort of ride through, you know, people's different money attitudes. And certainly, you know, like um, it's really highlighted for me the difference between, you know, sitting in front of my accountant with my group certificate and financial wellness, which is, you know, which you've articulated as being something completely different. If yeah. there was one piece of advice or one final thought that you'd like to leave everyone with, what would it be? And I just want to reinforce that to instead of looking externally for reasons, you, you look internally and um, look in the mirror and just start asking the questions. Start being really curious and ask lots of questions about yourself, how you're showing up, what triggers you. And that's, that's I, I want to shift this away from I was always looking external, so I know it well. And I got into situations there. And when I brought it back to internal and, and had that growth within me, it just changed my life. So... It's just such a powerful tool to be able to go inside and actually you know, work from there. Yeah, amazing. Michael DeHaan, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Elevate podcast with thanks to connectnow.com.au. Don't forget to get access to all of Elite Agent's premium resources, including a detailed episode guide for this podcast. Visit joineliteagent.com. 